Hello, welcome. I'm so glad to start off this little series, our Botany Bistro, and today is our first day. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun, and I just can't wait to, you know, share some botany and kind of nerd out a little bit with everybody. <laughs> um, I have designed this series as uh, a way for us to just share some botanical knowledge with each other um, and also hopefully have an opportunity for um, us to explore different ways to think about the plants in our lives. Um, but I know that during the lecture portion of the class, we won't be having um, any discussion or, um, you know, kind of live interaction. So I'm going to save that to the end. Um, so if you do have some questions, please keep them in mind uh, and we'll be happy to kind of share out at the end. Uh, I've also designed this so that it can be something that you listen to. Um, obviously, I'm happy to, um, you know, support with some visuals, but I know that some people on their lunch breaks would like to take a walk, um, or you might be listening to this as an archive, and so I wanted it to be um, able to be auditory. Um, so some of the things I'm going to discuss do have wonderful visuals uh, that you could explore after um, doing your own research if you're interested in learning more. So we're adding some extra people, which is wonderful. Um, and so before we go any farther, I just want to welcome you all to the Botany Bistro. Um, my name is Mary Dudley, and I am the Ecology Education Manager at the Civic Garden Center. We're based in Cincinnati, Ohio, and the Civic Garden Center is in Avondale. So if you haven't come to visit us, please come and see us. Uh, I'd love to give you a tour and talk to you about plants. Um, a little bit about me, uh, I have uh, two advanced degrees one from Miami University from Oxford, Ohio in botany and the other is in workforce development education from Bowling Green State University. Um, I just have a passion for plants and people. Um, I love figuring out how to connect some of the scientific world to the practical skills that are being done especially in schools by students and so really thinking about how to interpret some of that scientific knowledge and share it. Um, so this whole Lunch and Learn series was uh, brought about just from uh, a, a hope that I can share some of the knowledge that I have with you um, and it can enrich your lives uh, in different ways. And so we're going to be offering all of these classes for free. We'll also be archiving them. So if you miss a session or if you really like one and you want to share it, uh, those will be posted up on our YouTube channel. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but at the end of the course, I will open up the chat and so you'll be able to share questions, um, contact information, things like that. Um, so I'm really happy that you're here. And so I just want to go over quickly the course of the program and kind of the vision um, that we have. And so these will happen every other Friday. And so um, you'll be able to kind of get your science in, get your botany in every other Friday. Um, and each Friday is going to have a theme. And there are many, many different uh, aspects of botany. And so at its very core, I'll say that botany is the study of plants, the scientific study of plants. Um, but there are many, many branches. So as long as humans have been on this planet, they have wanted to know more about plants. Um, and we're just drawn to them. Uh, and, and that discovery has never ceased. Um, and so there are so many branches now to talk about. During our series over the next year, we will dive into morphology, anatomy, physiology, pathology, paleobotany, 
Um, the list goes on. And while each of these branches have that common thread of being something that pertains to plants, um, they all also have their own specific ways of looking through a different lens. So for example, ethnobotany is particularly focused on the study of how people interact with plants uh, versus plant pathology, which focuses on plant disease and how we can help mitigate some of the damages that happen with plant disease. Um, and then you have things like taxonomy, which are very focused on the naming and classification of plants. Now that's going to be an interesting session se series um, because with genetic information, we have actually had to rewrite a lot of the textbooks that I had in school, um, knowing that, oh, wow, these aren't as closely related as we thought based on their morphology, which uh, talks about the structures of plants, the observable structures of plants. And so uh, it's an exciting time uh, to be studying plants, and it's really great to have these conversations with people and learn more. Um, so just a little bit about why I'm so passionate about plants and how it has helped me. Uh, early in my journey, I wanted to become an engineer. Uh, I like thinking creatively. I like solving problems. Um, I like working with teams of people. And so I got really into something called paper science engineering, which was a field at Miami University that was uh, very lucrative and um, pretty specialized. And so I was like, oh, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study paper science. And one of the courses that we needed to take was a plant identification course, as lots of paper products are made from plant products. Um, and I took that course and it was the easiest day I ever got because I actually enjoyed doing the work. <laughs> um, reading the textbook was actually fun and I was very excited about it. And so um, I took that as a pretty good sign that I had found something I wanted to do. And we uh, jumped right in then to a botany undergrad, um, just studying as much as I could. And now, having worked at the Civic Garden Center on and off uh, several different times over the last 15 years, I can say with confidence that um, you know I just can never learn enough about plants, and I'm consistently surprised uh, by what we can discover if we know how to look and how to listen. And so botany, the foundation of how plants grow and function, has opened up a world of language that I can use that I would not have been able to interpret without that structure. And so that's the hope for these sessions is that we can set some framework, kind of build a lattice that we can grow off of um, and really discover how these plants work and understanding the function helps me diagnose and treat any challenges or problems that come up. Um, and so while I might not know every plant um, and I don't know every process, I can generalize to get me pretty far. And so we'll be doing that today. Um, without plants, I don't know where I would be. I spent uh, a small amount of time traveling in my younger years um, to places like Arizona, looking at that amazing desert biome, um, traveling to Colorado and looking at the dry landscapes, um, then spending obviously a lot of time here in Ohio in the Cincinnati region. And each space just has such a unique way of um, nurturing their plant life. And so I'm really excited to continue that journey and continue to explore new ecosystems and just be in awe of some of the things that our plant communities can do. Um, so today we're going to kick it off with a little bit of something to eat. So uh, I'll be perfectly honest, I don't eat uh, lunch that regularly at noon every day <laughs> um, when I'm at work. And so I'm excited to um, 
do that on Fridays with you. And so today for lunch, I brought a strawberry spinach salad. Um, and in this salad, I also have some almonds and I have chopped it off with a little lemon vinaigrette that has some olive oil, some lemon juice, and some pepper. And so we're gonna break this down. We're gonna break down our lunch and we're gonna talk about it with our botany goggles on uh, and really get into the nitty gritty of what's going on in the bowl. Um, and then after the session is over, about 12.40 or so, um, we'll get that chat turned on and we'll be able to have a few minutes together where we interact and share what else you might be having for lunch. So that's how we'll start today. And so um, I wanted to pick something that was in season and it is still spring, although it's very warm outside and very dry in Cincinnati right now. And so it feels like we're in the heat of summer already. Um, but my strawberries are being picked and the spinach is still coming on. Um, the almonds I did not grow <laughs> or the lemons, uh, but we'll hopefully focus on um, seasonal items throughout the class and so really make it something that we can also uh, just look forward to what's happening in each season. I was tempted to put mulberries into my salad. Uh, they are fruiting right now uh, in a great volume and so I keep stopping myself here and there on walks to have some mulberries um, and so if you see that nice little snack coming around definitely give it a try. Um, but definitely don't skip out on the strawberries right now either because they are delightful uh, and in season. So if you're into canning or making jellies, um, now's the time to get your strawberries. I did want to show a difference between the strawberries that I grew. So these came out of my garden. My daughter and I picked these this morning and the ones I got from the store. <laughs> um, so they're quite different. Um, mine are not fertilized uh, with any kind of chemical fertilizers, just with some um, manure and compost. And it's also been very dry, so um, they, they're a little bit small, uh, but they're both just as delicious. And so uh, these lovely little strawberries that we have. And so we'll talk about strawberries first. Um, strawberries are a really neat type of fruit. Um, and so as a botanist, the definition of a fruit is something that is ripened from a reproductive part of a plant. Um, and so most things that have seeds in them would be considered a type of fruit. Uh, I think of eggplants as fruit and peppers, tomatoes. Um, now my husband who loves to cook, uh, has worked in restaurants for a long time, comes at it from a chef lens. And a lot of times chefs will consider things that are savory to be vegetables and sweet to be fruits. Um, but we'll have our botany goggles on. And so these are fruits that we're talking about today for our strawberries. Now strawberries are also gonna be highlighted in our April session where I talk about biotechnology. Um, some of you might have done this in high school, but you can actually extract the DNA from a strawberry fairly easily um, with just a few steps. And you can actually visibly see these strands of DNA um, that are all kind of clumped together. Um, and that's because there's a lot going on inside our strawberries. Um, so strawberries grow low to the ground and they're fairly bushy. Sometimes they can send out what we call runners. And those little runners, those little kind of ground growing vines will root when they attach to the soil and produce new plants. And so maybe you have someone in your life that has uh, volunteered to donate strawberries to you because they have an overabundance of them. Um, but I really appreciate the way that strawberries are well suited to our environment and they're one of the earliest fruits that we get in this region. And so it's a real treat when we have our strawberries. They're pollinated by lots of different things. Um, and so a lot of the pollinators that are coming out earlier in the spring when the little white strawberry flowers are blooming uh, are things like ants and wild bees. 
Um, you'll get a lot of things that are pollinated by wind as well. Um, and so we're going to talk just a, briefly about the reproductive cycle of a strawberry. And so they have little flowers and those flowers contain male and female parts. And so just like, you know, your kind of high school biology class, you're talking about reproduction. Um, there are some plants that have these male and female parts on separate plants. And some flowers will have just male parts or just female parts. But the particular strawberry flower is what we would call complete or perfect because it has both male and female parts. And so it is self-fertile. And so you can aid the pollination with a pollinator um, or by kind of getting in there yourself and wiggling around the flowers a little bit. Um, but they are self-fertile. And so that's a pretty unique aspect for the strawberry to be able to reproduce effectively. And uh, something that is curious about this, and um, this is where you get to like share some secret botany knowledge next time you're with your friends. Um, so these little bumps on the outside of the strawberry uh, are not seeds. <laughs> they contain seeds. So we're going to uh, deep dive into this a little bit more and think about, okay, what is this? So there's lots of terminology uh, in different fields. I worked in the education field for quite some time and I have never known more acronyms in my life than <laughs> working in the field of education. Um, but in the field of botany, there are also lots of unique terms. A lot of them are Latin based. And this particular fruit is not a berry, actually. Um, it's a multiple fruit. And so if you look up the definition of a berry, you'll get some other examples. Uh, but this is technically a multiple fruit. Now, these little dots that are on the edge of the strawberry that look like seeds are called achenes, A C H. E N E S. And within each of these achenes, there is a seed if it has been properly pollinated, um, but they are their own fruits. So on this one strawberry, there are probably 200 plus separate fruits. Um, and they're all these little achenes. And so if we cut this in half, I've got my little handy dandy knife and my cutting board over here. And so if I cut this in half, you can see that there are little white lines that lead from each akin to the center. And so the center is a fleshy receptacle and it holds all these multiple fruits together. So I find that to be very, very advanced. Um, and the concept of holding all of these fruits together as one instead of very small individual fruits um, goes back to the concept of how this fruit is going to be spread and how this plant is going to propagate itself into the larger world. And so I love to eat strawberries, so I would be a good fruit spreader. Um, there are lots of critters in my garden that like to eat strawberries. Uh, my daughter found this one today that has a nice little hole in it already. <laughs> so some, something found it. Um, and I can't blame them, it's delicious. And it's very sweet. And so it is enticing to those seed dispersers to be able to eat that fruit, process those seeds from those achenes, uh, and then leave those seeds with a little bit of fertilizer somewhere. Um, I don't have a lot of wild strawberries growing in my yard, but they're definitely doing very well in my raised bed. So that's some fun little terms you can use next time you're enjoying strawberries with someone. You can give them a little bit of your botany knowledge. Now, in my 
uh, dressing. I have lemons, so it's a little lemon vinaigrette, so I wanted to also discuss our lemon here. Um, now the lemon is actually a berry. <laughs> I know, it like, doesn't make sense. The strawberry is not a berry. The lemon is a berry. Um, but a berry has this um, fleshy piece and it also has this rind. Um, and so you can think of other um, types of berries that will have this rind and this flesh. Lemons are also self-fertile. Um, the, the pollination does you know, help if you're, you're getting in there, if you have an indoor Meyer lemon tree or something like that, kind of wiggle them around. Um, but when we think about the differences between lemons and strawberries, um, lemons grow on trees, and so that creates a woody stem, whereas strawberries are low to the ground, and they don't produce a woody stem. But they are both perennials, and so a perennial comes back every year versus an annual, which will need to be planted again each year. And so we'll put our berry over here and we'll think about what is our vegetable of today. And our vegetable is our spinach. And so this is got this lovely vinaigrette on it. It's nice local spinach. Um, and it's just the leaf that I'm harvesting. And so the leaf is not a reproductive part of the plant. And so that is a vegetative part of a plant. Um, and so other things that we eat that are true vegetables would be lettuces, um, herbs that are from the leafy parts, certain roots are vegetables. Um, and so you can think about that vegetative part of the plant will continue to grow if you don't harvest all of it. So my spinach plants, which are not enjoying our current drought um, and are getting close to bolting, which means that they'll produce flowers and start to get quite bitter um, as they enter that reproductive phase. Um, but my spinach plants, I'm able to harvest a third of them at a time, a third of those leaves that are going on. I want to leave two thirds of the seeds for the opportunity for them to photosynthesize um, as they need to continue to grow and I hope to get those extra pieces um, throughout the season. Uh, but that vegetative part will continue to grow. Now if I pick the lemons off my tree, that part of the tree is not going to rebloom and remake lemons unless I change its environment in some way. Um, give it a different light cycle, something like that to have it enter a second reproductive phase. Um, whereas the spinach, I can have continual harvest until it starts to bloom. Um, and so that's our little vegetable for the day. Um, another neat thing you can do with spinach is that you can actually sow the seeds uh, in the early to early winter to late fall. And you can put those in your garden and have them set. They'll, they'll adapt to the cold and then they'll start to grow in the spring. Um, and so that is a practice I have started. And when you harvest spinach after it has been cold um, the nights before, it actually stores more sugar. And so it can be very sweet. Um, it's a really nice treat. And so try. I would recommend that you try that. All right, so we've talked about our perennials, our strawberries that aren't berries, and our lemons that are berries. We mentioned our spinach, um, and now we need to think about uh, the other, the nuts and the seeds that I'm using. Um, and so I have the almonds, and so almonds are a very interesting crop. Um, they are grown mostly in California, and it's a fairly early crop. Um, and so you actually need to move hives of bees from all over the country to California to pollinate all of the almond trees. Um, it's not 
uh, ecologically sustainable, in my opinion. And so this might be a more rare treat um, as we move forward. So if you enjoy almonds and almond milk, um, try to get it from a grower that you trust um, who practice sustainability uh, just so that we can hold on to that crop as much as we can. Um, so the almond is technically not a nut. <laughs> so I'm throwing a lot out here. It's like, oh my gosh, all of the things we learned as children are not true. Um, some of them are, but it's technically not a nut. It is called a droop, D-R-U-P-E. Um, and that is because it has a fleshy covering. So the fruit is a droop and it contains the seed. Um, now I've actually not held uh, almond fruit before. Um, I've seen pictures of them, but um, that is it's encased. And so uh, I wonder uh, what that would uh, be like. Maybe that's something I'll have to do next time I go out west. Now, true nuts are things like chestnuts, hazelnuts, acorns. Um, they're dry. Then we also have other droops like cashews and pistachios. Um, so that is the group that the almonds are in, are these droops. And I also have some olive oil in my vinaigrette. Um, that is also a droop because it is contained in this fleshy seed, uh, this fleshy fruit. And um, thinking about how they process olive oil, um, they actually pick them off the trees and they press the seed and the fruit together. And so uh, it's technically fruit juice, uh, olive oil. And so it's 100% fruit juice. Sometimes it is filtered and sometimes it is not. Uh, but it's a pretty interesting concept to think about um, olive oil as being fruit juice. And the peppercorns that I have in the dressing um, are curious because I did choose black ground pepper. Um, I have some whole black peppercorns here um, and they're very fragrant. And um, these are not crushed, but I did put ground in mine. And actually, if you look very closely at a peppercorn, you'll see that it has the black covering on it. Uh, that is the exterior of that fruit. And so the skin has been dried um, and left on the peppercorn. And so you, when you're eating pepper, you're also eating a fruit. Um, the outer layer is called a pericarp. Uh, that's the name for that kind of skin of the fruit that you can see on there. And so uh, if you haven't gotten up close with a peppercorn, I recommend that you take a close look at it. Now, white pepper has had that pericarp removed, and so it doesn't have quite the same flavor because the pericarp does impart a lot of flavor, um, and the white has it washed off. So uh, if you're interested in the differences of those, when you're eating white peppercorns, um, that is mostly just the seed. Whereas when you have black, you're eating a fruit. Um, and so if you do some thoughts on how your food pyramid goes <laughs> with your different um, items that you're eating, uh, it would be interesting uh, to see us use that in a botany way and say, oh, I am actually eating fruits uh, here. And so that is the basics of what I have in my lunch today. And so I'm very excited um, to eat that. And I wanted to um, just give you a little bit of a preview for a look ahead for some of the next um, segments that we'll be doing and invite you back before I turn on the chat and we have some fun back and forth. Um, and so our basic botany part two will be on June 16th. And during that session, I'm going to talk a little bit about botanical history uh, and the way that the field of botany has progressed over time. Um, I'm going to work in a global lens and then also focus locally on some things that are happening here in the Cincinnati region. And I, uh, as 
my teacher hat on, uh, I would love to give you a little bit of homework. <laughs> um, so before our next session, uh, I would encourage all of you to take some time to really observe a leaf, a single leaf for a full minute. And so set a timer on your phone because it's going to feel like you've seen everything about this leaf in about 10 seconds. And then after 20 seconds, you might see something new. And after 30 seconds, you might see something new. Um, and so if you're really going to be interested in exploring more about plants and digging deep, uh, that's your first assignment is to look at a leaf for one full minute. I uh, would encourage you to share your leaf on social media and tag the Civic Garden Center uh, and we can kind of explore our different leaves together. And so it'll be the same format. Uh, we will log on to the same link and so you can add it to your calendar um, every other week and we'll talk about what we're having for lunch and think a little bit about the history uh, of the botanists who have come before uh, and the work that they have done and how we can you know, stand on their shoulders.